Hi guys, welcome back to Snakes and Adders Advanced Series. This is episode 12 and this is an episode on the Indian rock python or Indian python, python mollerus. It's been a long time since we've done a video. I'm trying something different with camera position and using a special camera on top of my laptop. So I'm hoping that the recording comes through nice and clear. Um, and I've got my desk laid out with the resources that I've researched and printed out for uh, the introduction of this species. As always, we start with an example we've got in store. I like to try and do videos of animals that we actually have in. This is a young male Indian rock python that we've got in store currently. What an absolute beauty. He's a bit of a huffy and puffy little boy, but there's no real aggression. He's never tried to bite, but he's very vocal. <sighs> when you pick him up. He was a little iffy to get going with food, but now he's established and he feeds fine. He absolutely hoovers up. What a simply gorgeous snake. Just look at that pattern. Absolutely amazing. I'm not gonna hold him for too long because I don't wanna push him too hard, stress him out. There's no need really, because we're gonna be discussing the care of this species. But just look at him, God, amazing. Just pop him away and then we'll crack on. All right, stop puffing. So, to begin, Indian rock pythons were first described by Carl Linnaeus in 1758. Oddly enough, they were, con they were classified originally as Caluba malloris, along with so many other in Linnaeus's original papers. Caluba is ancient Greek translating to snake or serpent. Other odd changes that occurred in the species taxonomic history include being placed in the genus Boa. Boa. Which anybody with even a basic appreciation of snake seems odd. Schneider, who placed Python malaris in genus Boa in 1801, also designated five separate species to malaris. These included Boa ordinata, Boa cinerea, Boa castanea, Boa albicans, and Boa orbiculata. It's crazy, crazy. The first use of Python malaris by a naturalist was dowed in in 1803. There has definitely been some consternation about the presence of subspecies within Python malaris with various subspecific names, such as Var oscillatus, Var intermedia, and Var sondaiica. Python malorus bivitatus, which we now know as the Burmese python or Burmese rock python, was first described by Cool in 1820. This was then elevated to full species status by Jacobs in 2009 to Python bivitatus bivitatus with a further species added at the same time in the form of the dwarf Burmese python, Python bivitatus procchi. We have produced videos on both of these snakes. So if you look past through, through our past videos on YouTube, you'll be able to find those. Although they might not be as high resolution as the ones are now. The technology has developed as I've been doing this. And uh, yeah, some of them are pretty grainy from back in the day, but hopefully the information contained within stands uh, the test of time. Pythomolaurus pimbiora, which we know as the Sri Lankan rock python or tiger python as it's sometimes referred to, was first mentioned by, let me try and get this right, this is a tricky one, Deran Iyagala in 1945. Whilst this species is still much covered to and re referred to as the pimbiora in the hobby, science no longer recognizes uh, this is a subspecies and merely a locality. Ross and Mark, Marzek, in their superb tome, The Reproductive Husbandry of Pythons and Boas, states that the bloodlines had become so irre irreversibly damaged through hybridization that unless you got a complete history of the snake's family in captivity, you were more than likely going to be working with hybrids anyway, um, between Malaurus and Pimbiora. There's been efforts to establish a stud book, which is a record of who's keeping what where, so that people know who to contact to try and get progeny to be able to bolster their own groups um, for captive malaurus and what we would refer to as pimbiora in the hobby. 
but to my knowledge, this product, this project has now ceased or is certainly not commonly referred to and used as a resource. The Indian rock python occurs through the Indian subcontinent, including, as mentioned, the island of Sri Lanka. To the northwest of the range, it occurs in Pakistan. So I'll hold this up. This is a distribution map of the Malorus group. So I'll try and get my angle of the dangle right. There we go. To the northeast of the range, for Malorus, there is an integrate zone that occurs between itself and the Burmese python, Python bivitatus. This occurs in Bangladesh, Assam, Manipur, Mizoram, and into the extreme northwest of Myanmar, previously Burma, hence the Burmese python. So just to pause, this is the Indian subcontinent. This is Pakistan up here. This is Python Malorus' territory, a huge territory, huge. This is the island of Sri Lanka, previously Ceylon. This is our integrate zone in yellow, which is probably not going to get picked up that well by the camera. Then this is the remainder of the uh, distribution of the Burmese python, uh, python bivitatus bivitatus. And then if you know, it's all the way down here. Amazingly, that's the distribution of the dwarf Burmese python. Quite what it has to do with Burma, all the way down there on Java and Sulawesi. God only knows, but amazing. So Progchai, Bivitatus, Integrate Zone, Maloris, Kimbiora, as it was till it got rolled into uh, Maloris as well and is basically a locality. <clears throat> the mainland range of the Burmese python then continues through Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia and southern China, which we've just seen. Mark O'Shea notes that the differences in habitat between the two species uh, with Burmese pythons nearly always occurring near a water source and Indian pythons being far more comfortable uh, in drier climes throughout India. This means classically that the Indian python was cap uh, capable of a far larger range than the Burmese python. The Indian subcontinent is huge with a height of 2000 miles and a width of 1,822 miles, and an approximate range somewhere in the region of 1.7 million square miles, not including Pakistan or the extant countries leading over to Burma. This, of course, is not the case now. Uh, with Indian pythons being protected across their range, they are a CITES Appendix 1 animal uh, and require an Article 10 certificate and microchip being implanted once the animal reaches a meter in length. India has now made it illegal to own pythons in an effort to try and protect the species, but with deforestation uh, and a growing and spreading human population plus ingrained uh, fear, absolute fear by the rural people that would come in contact with this, they're often killed when they are encountered and it's not easy to hide when you're 16 foot long and 150 pounds in body weight. Um, so it, this, the, the Indian python is regularly put in harm's way, which is threatening their population. Indian rock pythons are one of the five giants. The others would be the reticulated python, Malaya python reticulatus, the Burmese python, which we're discussing as well, python bivitatus, the African rock python, python sebae, the amethystine python, Somalia amethystina, and the green anaconda, Eunectes murinus, the only boid or boa to feature on this list. Python malorus is the type species for genus python, which may come as a surprise to uh, royal and ball python breeders. Type species means uh, if you want a, to present a typical animal from the genus, python malorus would be the species that would be presented. Then we're going to just quickly, before I go into the scutellation differences that Marco Shea noted, I've got three pictures because I've been lucky enough to photograph and keep all three, three of the subspecies. So this is your Indian python. It may well be a sister of the one that we've just uh, handled a moment ago. This is an Indian python. This is a Burmese python. So you can see uh, far... Uh, larger saddles and a far stronger arrow on the head. 
And then this is the Pimbiora. This is probably the rarest of the bunch. And it's not the greatest photo. It was taken a long time ago. It was produced by a friend of mine called Tony Howarth. Um, and it's got beautiful peach tops to the arrows. And that's one of the distinctive characteristics, as well as very jagged, very extenuated edges to the saddles on their back. Let's go back to what Mr. O'Shea has to say. O'Shea also makes mention of the difference in scutellation between the Indian and Burmese pythons. This comes down to their facial scales. The Indian rock python's supralabial scale makes direct contact with the ocular scale. So the lip scale meets uh, the eye, basically. Um, the Burmese python, however, has a subocular. So subocular scales are the scales that surround the eye and the subocular separates the supralabial or upper lip scale from the ocular scale. And this is one of the main differ differences. Indian rock pythons are a very large and powerful snake, sometimes of questionable demeanor. Whilst wild caught animals have recorded extra ordinary lengths, well in excess of 20 feet in captivity, they, they tend to be smaller than this, with females generally reaching around 14 feet in length and males a little over 10 feet in length. If animals are heavily fed, this can be achieved uh, very quickly and this, spe this species is capable of exponential growth. This most certainly would not be recommended, not for the long-term health of the animal anyway, with additional pressure being put on the renal system of the animal, which could collapse and fail. The overproduction of lipids or fats stored on these snakes present the biggest threat to Indian rock pythons. Obesity is believed to be an epidemic in snakes in captivity, and care must be taken to raise this species slow and responsibly. A female should take a minimum of five years to reach breeding weight, with the preference being that it should take even longer, sometimes up to a decade. If we were to grade the general temperament of the three subspecies as they were, Indian rock pythons would fall somewhere in between. Burmese pythons are quite possibly some of the gentlest of all giant snakes. Indian rock pythons can be a mixed bag with some sweethearts and some little devils. Sri Lankan rock pythons are renowned for being irascible and foul-tempered. Ross and Marsek noted that some keepers would assume the testy or aggressive Indian rocks in captivity would have probably had Pimbiora blood somewhere in their past. I just think this is down to natural variance. And in truth, you get good and bad with all species. I've been bit by enough corn snakes and royal pythons to know that myself. As with all pythons, Indian rock pythons are ovoviviparous, meaning that they lay eggs. They are potentially part of the illustrious 100 club, where particularly large proven females in theory could develop 100 ova or embryos in a single clutch or litter. This is true of the reticulated python, Burmese python and African rock python. You would think size would be an imperative to be able to achieve this feat, but in truth, it's not the case. The green water snake, Nerodia cyclopion, uh, a colubrid from North America, the Ferdelans, Bothrops asper, and Neotropical Pit Viper, the Tiger Snake, Nochetis scutatus, and Australian Elapid are all part of this club, but the record is held by a Puffada Bitis aritans that gave birth to 156 young in a single litter. Holy shit. Wow. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> captive care of Indian rock pythons um, is much the same as for Burmese pythons. This is not a needy snake as such um, and has, a proven to, has proven to be a robust captive that rarely presents issues. On occasion, they may be slightly fussy about food and this tends to be males who can make life hard when it comes to feeding. This with patience and the trialing of different prey types is often overcome. Once started, they tend to be reliable enough uh, but may go through fasting periods, and this will stall growth over an extended period. Hence why it may take uh, so much longer to establish to an adult weight for a breeding pair. Burmese pythons rarely display this behavior and feed much more readily. Female Indian rock pythons once established in feeding as babies rarely put a foot wrong. As long as you expect it, it won't come as a shock. But if you expect a male Indian to be as straightforward as a male Burmese, that's where you might come unstuck. It goes without saying this species is going to require room and lots of it. 
Hopefully that's not an alien concept to people watching this video. You're keeping a giant. Now you might be buying it at the size of the baby that we've just shown you, but you have got to cast your mind forward. That's just common sense, which on occasion, sadly, is lacking in this hobby. There is a real push in the hobby to give giants adequate space to enter into natural behaviors, including climbing and roaming opportunities. This cannot be done in a six by two by two vivarium. If you are serious about purchasing such a species, an assessment must take place to ensure that you can provide for it throughout its entire life cycle. A male ideally should have a minimum of an eight by four by four enclosure and a female a 10 by four by four or even bigger. It may be an idea to use a bedroom or to insulate and board out part of a garage for this species. This is beyond the scope of many keepers and precisely why this species has been placed into the advanced series. It just simply isn't achievable for most keepers. We like the idea of them, but the logistics and the reality is just not that many people are going to be able to provide that sort of environment for them. Gone are the days where we have a stripped out six by two, two by two viv on newspaper. It isn't 1992 anymore. We must afford the giant species the same quality of life as their smaller counterparts seen across the hobby. Heating a monster enclosure of this type is an undertaking in itself, and we have to look to zoos for cues and ideas about how to do this. Many zoos in their large enclosures utilize short wave infrared patio heaters to do the bulk of the work, and there may, there may well even need to be a secondary heater along the temperature gradient uh, to bolster cold end temperatures to avoid them from dropping too low. This could maybe take the form of a radiant heat panel used on the back wall, such as the Reptirad, which has made excellent strides in the UK herb scene. They've also introduced some really high wattage larger units, which you might find you can use instead of the shortwave infrared uh, heater, and they're really low intrusion into the tank. So maybe that's worth a, a shot as well. Heating the growing on vivariums is easy enough, utilising ceramic heat emitters, deep heat projectors, or the smaller reptirads previously mentioned. Ultraviolet lighting is now industry standard for snakes, along with lizards, tortoises, and crocodilians. In the grow-on enclosure, but even though we're calling it a grow-on enclosure, it's still probably going to be a 6 by 2 by 2 or something. A 6% Pro T5 up on the ceiling would be fine because the level of UV would have degraded by the time it hits the floor. And we're aiming for a UV index of between one and two at the basking spot. This should be placed next to or within the vicinity of the main heat source. A UVB is only efficiently absorbed with heat, so there's no use to mounting it at the cool end. This may give a visual imbalance to the enclosure, got a lit end and a dark end. Uh, and the utilisation of LED strips, a second strip light, not necessarily that gives off UVB emissions, or a daylight LED such as the Jungle Dawn or New Dawn solutions from UK manufacturers. Basking temperatures during the day should be in the region of 32 to 34 degrees Celsius with the opportunity to retire from this spot. The cool end should be stable at 26 degrees. Being less closely associated with dense forest, or riparian forest, and riparian forest basically is the forest that would crop up along watercourses, feeding off the, the water flow within the rivers and streams, um, such as for the Burmese python. So they can cool down more at night. So this is where we talk about biome and habitat. And if you've got less tree cover, then the degradation of temperatures at night would be far more severe than the insulation properties of the trees holding the temperature higher for longer. They would also, those forests would also take the edge off the extreme heat during the day on the Indian subcontinent. So you'd find that, you know, the Indians are, on paper at least, according to distribution, tougher than Burmese. Um, basking temperature can reduce to 27 to 28 degrees at night and a cool end of 22 degrees Celsius. He will always need to be provided, though, and a reduction to room temperature, reduction down to room temperature is not recommended. We will look further into their natural seasonality and temperatures at the end of the video. And that was a big undertaking because India is a big place and that was a lot of data to crunch. According to Ross and Marzek, 
in the reproductive husbandry of pythons and boas, their breeding follows the same pattern as Burmese pythons, which I have bred. Uh, I have never produced the Indian rock python. This would involve a reduction in nighttime temperature and a day temperature that remains consistent. The cooler nights aim to aid sperm production, which is referred to as spermatogenesis, and over follicle production in females, which is oogenesis. Some animals may cycle and breed without temperature variance controlled by man and pick up on the changes in barometric pressure over the course of the year signaling uh, to begin courtship. Males utilize their anal spurs, the vestiges of legs they once, once possessed as lizards earlier in their evolution to tickle the females back to stimulate breeding. And females may also gape their cloaca during this period. Now somewhere, here it is. This is a page. I just photocopied from Ross and Marzek. Really, I mean, that camera's not picking it up that great. There you go. So up here is mating and how it runs throughout the year. This is oviposition or egg laying. And this is hatching. So that's how the year would run. I just can't get it to pick it up. There you go. That's in the North American captivity. At least They're not recording that from the wild. They're recording that from their own research that they did at their facility. Where are we going? Um, females that have been successfully fertilized will enter into sunning behaviors and bask almost incessantly. This will involve inverting most of their body, pointing the belly to the sky. Females will coil and brood their eggs once they give birth, and most keepers would opt to remove the clutch and artificially incubate the eggs. Females will return to food qu quicker and lose less condition as a result. The brooding female will go forego food to stay with her eggs in most cases, there are exceptions to that. And the loss of body weight and condition can be dramatic. Egg incubation generally lasts 60 to 65 days with an incubation temperature of 32 degrees Celsius. The incubation medium can be core, moss, perlite or vermiculite. Personally, I prefer vermiculite, it's what I've always used. Uh, I mix it to a ratio of 3.5 to one with water and that's by volume. So you use a cup or a mug or a jug probably a jug given the size of the eggs and the size of the clutch. Um, uh, and I will have the media ready prior to the eggs arriving. Females will shed their skin between 21 and 35 days before laying their eggs. Babies are born at between 40 and 55 centimeters in length, obviously dependent on the size of the female that laid the eggs and the size of the eggs themselves and can consume small mice from birth. Uh, they're born with big yolk sacs and you can expect to have a bit of a faff getting them going. Uh, lots of huffing, maybe bluff striking, but actually wrapping and grabbing is a bit of a challenge. So there will be somewhat of a delay getting the babies going. And this is even true of Burmese pythons. I expect that it would be even more problematic with Indians. Expect females that you remove eggs from to be less than impressed <laughs> with this situation. And all you need to do is watch that idiot Jay messing around with female or ticks annoying them on purpose to know that a female really wants to protect her eggs and her brood and um this should be done in as stress-free stress-free a way as possible not for views on youtube and they will happily smash you to bits to get their eggs so towels gentle removal and trying to make the process as smooth and expedient as possible so now we're going to look at climate data for the natural range of the Indian rock python. Because it's such a huge range, we have taken the readings from a number of airfields across India. Disclaimer. Please bear in mind that this is macro climate data, not micro climate data. This data does not exist for me to be able to produce it on a video such as this. So what do I mean by that? Around the world, generally on airfields, there are climate stations that will record rainfall, dew point, daytime high, nighttime low. Um, and this is all fed into these computers. Now, they are scattered all over the world. And because India is such a big place, um, there is a number of airfields across India where I was able to access the data. What this actually does is it serves to take some of the sharp edges off the changes, which is what we kind of what we do in captivity anyway. We don't do the exaggerated stuff. Generally, they're on thermostats. In fact, they should always be on thermostats. Just as a note for you there, do not try and heat a giant snake without a thermostat. They require it just as much as any smaller species. Um, 
and by taking averages that smooths curves and that would be more uh, representative of what we uh, do in captivity. Let me just find my climate graphs. There we go. So because India is so very big, I split it into four groups with six airfields from each area. So northeast, northwest, central, and southern. And this was to be able to give us an idea. If we want to discuss the areas themselves, let me find that, see if I can find, here we go. So in the northwest, let me hold this up. In the northwest, we studied data from Ahmedabad, Indore, Mumbai, Nashtik, Kota, and Amrivati. In the northeast, we studied Nagpur, Kampur, Patna, Bramnapur, Durgapur, and Kolkata. The central group was Pune, Nanded, Bishkitatnam, Nellore, Shivamogga, Kalabaragi. And the southern group, Mangaluru, Bengaluru, Chennai, Kochi, Madurai, and Colombo on the island of Sri Lanka. This was to try and give us the most accurate overview. Now, if you think that I've, like, I've had to type in the daytime high, nighttime low, and rainfall for all of them, <laughs> it's been uh, some work, I can tell you. Now, I thought I've got the rainfall document as well. If not, no, we'll have to go just do the temperatures. So, using, let me get the angle of the angle right. Using the daytime high data, the dotted red line is the averages. And this is the way that the temperatures work. We peak in May as an average at about 38 degrees Celsius, rising from January at 28 degrees Celsius. Now, this is where the term Indian summer comes from as well. You might be able to see this thinner blue line, which is one of the more exaggerated groups, and that's for the northwest, the term Indian summer, where we would have a peak, a trough, and then a peak, and then another trough. So when we get those sorts of hot Octobers in Britain, you know, it's in common parlance to refer to them as an Indian summer. That's where the saying comes from in visual form. When we average it out, there's only a slight kickback, maybe only a degree or so. But this is the arc throughout the year. We then look at nighttime low. We can see once the camera adjusts to pick it up, those averages again. Now, this is interesting in as much as during that cooler period midsummer, actually, that provides the hottest nights. So that's really strange that we've got, normally you would find that they follow pattern, almost paired. So hot days equal hot nights. Well, the cooler days produce hotter nights. It's madness. So it's a really interesting continent, like, you know, climate wise. We start off in January at an average of around 16 degrees Celsius. And we climb again into May where it's peak temperatures during the daytime to a 25 degree night. And it pretty much maintains that maybe only drop into 24 degrees all the way through till September. And then from September, we would drop off again. So if we previously discussed spermatogenesis and eugenesis, this would occur during these cooler periods. That's when that process would be able to take place. We also know, unfortunately, can't find the rainfall, but this, the peak rainfall happens here. It spikes right in the center. And that means this is the wet season. That means that's when the prey starts to arrive. So spermatogenesis and eugenesis begins, mating, of a position, babies feeding, and then retiring for the year. That would be that it would work naturally for the Indians. What we've got here as well, let it pick up. There we go. This is the daytime high and nighttime low paired together. So you can see sort of the bandwidth between daytime high and nighttime low. How we've got this weird truncation of daytime high, but nighttime low is maintained. So the closest bandwidth between daytime high and nighttime low occurs during that wet season. And some of these places are monsoonal. They'll have 250 to 300 mil of rain in a single month 
during some of these periods. But what you'll also get in certain regions is probably four to six months of drought where it's bone dry. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on the Indian rock python. I've enjoyed making it. It's good to get back to it. And it's something that I'm going to be keep doing moving forward. And hopefully this setup works better where I can get the resources in place to be able to show you. And obviously we can use quotes from the, some of the best books that are out there on the subject. Um, and we're going to be working uh, on some more guides. We're also now introduced a podcast called Trade Time, where we talk to uh, shop owners in the UK about their experiences within the industry, um, some good, some bad, some ugly, uh, and it makes for an interesting conversation. They're now available on Spotify, um, and we are going to be trying to work through some of the species that we've got in stock to be able to keep these guides moving forwards. Uh, I really enjoy uh, the research. I find it thoroughly interesting. I hope you do too. Uh, and if you could subscribe, like or share, that would be really useful. So until next time, guys, see you later.